The following program contains discussion of real-life law enforcement situations and may include graphic content and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to End of Watch with Bootsy and Sal. We're your hosts, Kevin Grogan and Lou Velosi. We'll weigh in on topics that affect the law enforcement community and invite guests who have their fingers on the pulse of our nation. With over 40 years of combined law enforcement experience, ranging from patrol to multi-million dollar federal investigations, we are not going to pull any punches. Uh, just want to give a quick shout out to our boy, Chris Tucker. Uh, Chris Tucker is a former Savannah Chatham Metropolitan Police Officer who is running for sheriff of Pickens County, Georgia. And I, you know, we always talk about not being political. You know, we're not political guys. We don't get there. You know, sometimes I don't even vote unless there's something uh, important going on. But Chris Tucker is the real deal. You know, he, he's a guy that put it all out on the streets here in Savannah, Georgia. And, you know, he was just an absolute warrior. You know, the, the bad guys hated him because every time they'd see his bald head coming, they, they knew, you know, they had to watch and change what they were doing. But to see him transition from a street guy to get into politics, which to me is just crazy, you know, knowing Chris and the way he is. But uh, I've listened to his campaign and talking about uh, his community and, and uh, what he plans to do up there. And we wish uh, Chris T Tucker all the success in the world again, Pickens County, Georgia. But I digress. We got a very special guest here and Sal, I'll let you take it. Yeah, so vote for Chris Tucker. He's a pipe header for sure. I remember him on the streets. Um, all right, so today we finally, Bootsy, have one of our uh, few successful guests. Most of our guests have not been very successful. They're always in trouble. Yeah. So we got a guy who's right, right. always jammed up who is successful and uh, again, full disclosure, a guy who I knew 30 years ago in my young days uh, out in Los Angeles, running the mean streets of the South Bay. Um, and his name is Mo Galini. Mo is a successful actor uh, and he's played a lot of parts and Bootsy's gonna go over the list. He's played a lot of parts of guys who we've had on this podcast, Mo, because if you look back at our guests on this podcast, we've had a lot of military guys, a lot of law enforcement guys, and a lot of victims of the justice system, mm -hmm. guys who have been incarcerated, uh, incarcerated wrongly in our opinions. Because uh, what Bootsy and I do in this podcast, Mo, is we like to point out the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, it, just in the, in the justice system here in our country. Uh, great successes. Uh, Bootsy and I both had great successes in our careers. We both had great failures. Um, and we've seen uh, the justice system work in the right way, and we've seen it work in the wrong way. We both uh, agree it's the best justice system in the world. Sure. But it's got some issues. Yeah, and we, and that's, you know, we, we bring people in, we like to talk about it and point this out. You are the second actor that we have had uh, we had Billy Smith on here, who was recently in The Irishman, who was also in The Departed, uh, who's played a lot of, he hasn't done as long as you, he's played a lot of great roles like you have. Um, and, and so we wanna branch out and start talking to actors, because uh, Bootsy, Bootsy is a wannabe actor, Bob. I'm gonna tell you that right off the bat. I, this, I don't like to brag, but I, yeah. I am in a film with two Academy Award winning actors. It just hasn't been released yet. But yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a movie with Mara Savino and Richard Dreyfuss. It's hard to beat. You know? It's a non-speaking role for sure, Mo. Um, Way background. Right. So, so first of all, welcome to the podcast, Mo. And can you introduce your daughter? Well, we got a guest plus one. Yep. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. This is my... I guess your special guest as well. This is my daughter, Ophelia, Hi. who is feeling a little under the weather today. I don't know if she was acting, but um, <laughs> at home, we're trying to figure out what's going on there with everyone getting sick lately. Um, so yeah, thanks for having us. You know what, man, you, you struck a nerve when you were talking about your show. Um, this is a part of my life that, you know, how you kind of block stuff up um, and you forget about it. Um, my dad was incarcerated and the story when I was a child, I didn't even know that he was in jail. Um, 
but the story was they were trying to get this is in Miami in the 70s coming into the 80s and they were trying to get a big heroin uh, supplier and they kind of took everyone down who worked for him. My dad kind of worked in a body shop uh, with that this guy owned and he kind of got caught in that domino effect and, and I know I know that it, it affected his life because he um, he kind of held that you know that un unjust that you're talking about this injustice of kind of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and you pay the price as the dominoes fall you know so thanks for striking that nerve it's me. it's easy to get up it's easy to get caught up in that system but miami you know late 70s early 80s it's you know the cuban crime wave is is was yep. big down there and your your mother's cuban correct Yes, sir. You go by Mo, Mo Mogolini, but that's that's not your true name. No, my birth name was Mohammed Galayini. My dad was from Lebanon. My mom was Cuban. They met on the beach in Miami, and you know that was that was home. Yeah. It was a small country town when I was a kid there. Now it's you know you need to speak Spanish first when you go down there. Right. Hey, Mo. Yes. Before I want to ask you and just talk to you because we want to hear about how you got into this, right? How you got into this career. But first, I want Bootsy to kind of run down because it is an amazing resume you have, man. This is uh, a this is a long and distinguished, and I'm, I'm going to skip some or we'll be here for the entire time. But Go ahead, Bootsy. You started out uh, as a Notre Dame football player in the all-time classic, one of my favorites, Rudy, with Sean Austin. You're in yes, Crimson sir. Tide, that was... Uh, Crimson Tide, Sean Connery. Uh, no, 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 that's oh, not the right one. No, Crimson. Denzel. Yeah, Denzel Washington oh, no, and, and Gene Hackman, right? Gene Hackman, Vigo Mortensen, Gandalf Man, Phoenix. Man, Vigo It was, uh, it was uh, every day was just a lesson to watch these guys go at it. Oh, like, like I said, I, hey, we're going to edit out. We're yeah. going to edit out where I said Sean Connery. That's Dis a rare mistake. Distinguished is, is putting it lightly. Rockford Files, NYPD Blue. One of the reasons I became a cop, I wanted to be Detective John Kelly. Yes. Uh, Melrose Place, Brooklyn South, Mike Hammer, Private Eye, Beverly Hills 90210, The X-Files, End of Days, VIP, A Better Way to Die, Jack, General Hospital, Nash Bridges, Mulholland Drive, The District, Too Fast, Too Furious, 24, NCIS, Marco Polo, ER, Get Smart, so, man, yeah, I could yeah. go on for days. CSI New York, NCIS Los Angeles. Take a drink of water, man. Take a drink. Go over some of the recent ones, man. It would have been quicker to read uh, movies you haven't been in. Chicago Fire and the new MacGyver. Yeah, and, I was just in your neck of the woods last year around this time doing MacGyver. They filmed that in Atlanta. Um, yeah, well, I tell you, George, the film industry in Georgia, and especially in Savannah, because all the tax incentives is huge. But, I mean, with a resume like that, it, the people that you've seen and worked with and been a part of, I mean, in all candor, when Lou mentioned your name, I was like, I didn't recognize the name. But as soon as I saw a picture of you, I'm like, that, that's the guy. Yeah. You, you've become one of those guys in Hollywood, and you've done it on the small screen and the big screen. Yes. I, well, I start at know. the beginning, man. Tell us how you got into it, man. You know, I – Grew up in Miami, like I said, I wanted to play football. That was my childhood dream. I used to throw the ball in my front yard by myself, catch it, uh, played, went to the state championship um, in high school. Um, that's the path I was choosing. My sister, who was a year and a half older than me, she wanted to be an actor. And she moved to California right after high school. I went off to college, different path, and um, I, I followed her out to Los Angeles in 1985, end of 1985. I was a 19-year-old kid, and um, my, my sister was part of this group called Young Artists United, and it was Robert Downey Jr., uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, like all the people who, Rob Lowe, all these 80s, you know, kids who were just hitting it big. And I remember going to a, a party 
at, it was after Top Gun. It was at uh, Meg Ryan was living with Anthony Edwards, who was on ER. Yeah, he played. They were in Top Gun. Yeah, that was Goose, man. The couple. Um, he played Goose. Yeah. So I was at a party at their house, and I met a friend who was also in this group. Uh, his name was Doug Warhit, and he was an acting coach. And I had just moved out here, didn't know you know many people. And he said, "Come to my class." And I was like, "All right, let me check this out." Like I didn't know what it was, and that class was just so raw for me. There was such a good core group of people that we stayed together for years, just learning what acting was. And we would write our own stuff. We would we would perform it. Um, but then it was this weird dichotomy because. I didn't know what an actor was. Like, what did it mean to have a job as an actor if you weren't a star? You know, you know, you know who a star is, but you know, I used to go to this gym and the guy who would sell um, the sales there, he said, oh, I'm an actor. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, you're always here working. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. what does that mean? So I was having this big conflict of like, is this what I want to do or is this what I'm, I'm, I'm doing to hide from doing anything else. And I just, I stayed in that place for a few years, just acknowledging, like, I really like tapping into whatever I tap into when I do my work. And then it was just like, okay, I'm going to do this. And back in the day, you know, I used to, I had no credits. I would sneak onto all the lots, drop off my picture and say, hey, you know, I'm here. And, um, you know, I ended up getting the, de the, the job in end of days and I got to fight Arnold. I got to sit down with Rod Steiger, two-time Academy Award winner, um, because I walked in the office. And um, I was kind of fearless in the beginning because there was no rules. You know, well, everyone if, else was if like- If you don't you know, know any better, man, you just stick your nose into it. You just do it and you just start doing it. Um, you know, and then after years, you start doing more stuff and you think that's not, you know, you don't need to do that anymore. But I can always go get myself a job before anyone else, before my agents or anything. I can go and find a job if, if I get off my butt and just, you know, hustle. Just like anything else, you have to hustle. So it's a whole different skill set of going and going. But when you're there and you, you're in unfamiliar territory, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do that. Big time. You know, it, sometimes it takes a little ignorance, like ah, you don't really know that you're breaking the rules, but it takes guts to stick your face in when you start talking to about guys like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and that kind of stuff. You're like, hey, you know, I'm Mo, I, I can play this part. And a well, good point is that you could do that today, what you did. I mean, I'm sure things are different. You can't, uh, you can't sneak on the lots yeah. anymore. Like, I remember specifically knowing when everything had changed. It was, it was a week after 9-11, and I, was, I had an appointment to go audition for the, the second Silence of the, the Lambs, the Hannibal movie that they Hannibal. made. Yeah. Good and it was at the Sony Studios, and I remember driving up to the, to the lot, and I, I had an appointment, but like they had all these dogs sniffing dogs and uh, the sniffing dogs and like the camera, uh, the little mirrors that go under your car. And it was like, it was heavy to go in the, into the studios. And I got to the, to the gate and they go, uh, can we see your ID? And I had never been asked for my ID before. And I thought they were asking for the, for the, like my ID that I work here. I was like, no, 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 I just have an appointment. And then realizing that my acting name is different than my real name on my ID, and I pull it out, and I'm like, Mohammed Galahini. I was like, oh, my life's going to be different from now on. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. You have to start, like, you know, you have to make people aware. Like, I have to check, you know, every time I fly for a job, I have to make sure they have my correct stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's a different world. 9-11 changed things for everybody. Um, yeah. Yes, especially they, if your name was Mohammed. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so and you didn't, what? you know, I changed my name in the beginning because, you know, coming the early, the late 80s, early 90s, you know, the Gulf War was just a few years out and, and um, it wasn't kosher to be Mohammed Galaini. 
like now I think it would help if I had that name because they want the yep. ethnicities and there's that kind of role. But I don't want to limit myself because, you know, I'm half Cuban. I, I'm fluent in Spanish, Arabic, like wherever I can fit in, I want to sneak in there. Absolutely. There's a lot of different angles you can, you can hit it from for sure. Yes. Right. So brother, bring us to the question. That how, how do we get to Rudy? Rudy, man? yeah. Let's That's go to Rudy, man. <laughs> tell us how that came about. And just tell us a little so, bit about it. Rudy, I was working at this really exclusive little uh, nightclub at the Santa Monica airport. And the director, David Ann Spa, he used to come in all the time. He was going through a divorce. And me and my friend Kenny would just sit there and talk to him. And, and you know, he did the classic movie uh, Hoosiers with Gene Hackman. Mm -hmm. We know, we know who he is and all. And he goes, I'm getting ready to do this football movie in Indiana. He goes, I want you guys to come. So we show up in South Bend. And well, first of all, there's more to the story. So I had an audition for this role in the movie and it was the only real person in real life that wouldn't get um, give them permission to use any of his his name or his, his likeness in the movie. So they had to, to redo the part. So I didn't get that role because of this guy. He was the Italian backup quarterback for Notre Dame. So they changed the part and they were still like, I was already in Indiana and they didn't know what they were doing with this role. And that role ended up being turned into this guy and he was a running back now. And that's the part that Vince Vaughn ended up, they brought Vince Vaughn, he was a young, you know, young kid, right. and he came in to do that part. Um, and he was kind of geeky they, looking back then. He was skinny, really. Oh, there's a, yeah. so the story. The story is that so in this part, he at the end of the movie to get Rudy to come into the game, he's the running back. They do a pitch out. He throws the ball to the wide receiver, and they score a touchdown, and that gets the defense back on the field. That's when everyone starts chanting for Rudy. But Vince couldn't throw the ball, so you're <laughs> dealing with a bunch of football players and. That happens, and they're like, ah. So they kind of, <laughs> Vince kind of went over to this pile with all these football players over here. And that's how he ended up hooking up with John Fabra, who was in the movie. They became buddies, Dang. and they came back and did swingers in their career. I wish I, I wish I would have gone that way, you know? Picked you up. Didn't throw a football, right? Yeah. Oh, man. That's <laughs> so, that ride. So it's funny, you know, you see these behind the scenes stories, and you watch, like, there's magic that happens and you don't understand it, you know? Wow. That was fate. They were supposed to meet and go that way. No yeah. doubt, man. So they pulled his man card because he couldn't throw a football and he ends up pairing up with John Favreau. And, and the rest and is history. The rest is history, man. But, you know, like, I had so much. That's still to this day one of my favorite experiences because I didn't know what movie making was. Hey, is, is the pop girl taking her? Is she taking some time off there? There were props earlier. Ophelia, where's your props, man? Oh, where's the prop? Where's the Rudy jacket that you're gonna bring? I, got this. So I have my uh, my Rudy feature film jacket framed. They put it like an old Notre Dame, uh, uh, like Letterman's jacket. Yeah, they yeah, gave yeah. It to us. I don't know if you guys can get a good see. It's kind of wrinkled up in here. There's a lot of light. What a what a oh, great experience. Awesome. This, is the back, this is the back of the jacket. On the front, it has the Notre Dame helmet. Yep. Uh, that's so great. cool. So, yeah. oh, you you do, Rudy. You, now you start getting getting roles in, like, great TV shows and great movies. You got a good look. So, you got, first of all, you got a, a tough guy look, right? So, a good bad guy look. And Well, the thing is, like, you have to realize, I shaved my head... Uh, when I was 26 years old, I saw this movie. I don't know if you guys are familiar with who Luc Besson is. Luc Besson did The Professional. He directed The Professional, yep. The Fifth Element, all these big movies. Before The Professional, he did this movie called The Big Blue. And Jean Reno, who was the professional in that movie, was in it. And this young guy, his name was Jean Macbar. And he had a crew cut. So you have to you have to realize I'm a 20 something year old actor with my Elvis haircut, 
I'm going into all these rooms. Everyone looks the same. I don't understand whatever's going on. I see this movie and I just see this guy's face is so strong when he has this crew cut. And I go to my friend who used to cut my hair. Her name was Kelly at Carlton Hair back in the day. And I said, cut my hair off. And she wouldn't do it. Like she, she cut it, but she left it, you know, kind of the same. I left there, went to Target, bought a hair clipper, and I buzzed my hair. And no one had hair like that. I mean, yep. Telly Savalas was, when I was a kid, that was the one ball guy, Yule Brenner. And no one else had that look. And I just wanted to, you know, jump into that. And that's how I started. Now everyone has a ball head, but everyone. when I started, it wasn't common. And I just wanted to distinguish myself from from everyone else that I was competing against. Now, it's an interesting perspective because you walk in there and everybody looks the same in your exactly. type. So, you yeah. know, what can you do to stand out? That's good strategy right there. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, then I started being put in this box of being the bad guy. And, and you embrace it in the beginning. There comes a point where you know, you want to branch out, but right. people, you know, they see you a certain way. It's hard to, to, um, to get other opportunities because you have to realize that the, the guys who are playing the cops and, you know, the lawyers, they're on that list. And they're, that list is this long with all those guys who are doing that. And they've been doing that for 30 years. So it's hard to break over there. You're on this list. You know, you move up here and, and everyone goes, I remember I just had this full circle that came around. Um, so going back to NYPD blue, um, I did a couple episodes as different characters. And on the first one, I play this bad guy who has a, a girl like to the head. I'm this biker. Um, and they're looking for me. And Jimmy Smits and Dennis Franz were supposed to be the cops who come and bust me. And three days before I start shooting, they change the, they rewrite it and they switch the cops to Nicholas Totoro and Gordon Clapp. Um, so I never got to work with Jimmy Smits. And now 25 years later, I just finished working on uh, his new show. I did the Bluff pilot City. episode in Memphis, Bluff City Law. Yep. But I had met him on, on the set and we, we had this great conversation and he was saying, basically to summarize it, like he, he had gone on, on all these plateaus and you move up and your competition is, is smaller. And then you get to the top of this plateau and your competition's like, let's say five or 10 guys but he wants to do the stuff over here. Let's say that Paul Newman or whoever is doing, and he can't go over there. Like he's not on that plateau. He's over here. So you stay and you do what they allow you to do here. And I've kind of always used that as, as an example. Like that's how I feel. Like you climb up this, you know, these, these levels, your competition gets smaller, but then you're just here. They know you for this work and that's what they bring you in to do. It yeah. makes sense, man. No, and, and Jimmy Smith was red hot then, right? He was, wasn't he LA Law? Like LA Law. That? LA Law. And then, you know, that's when the the first year that um, that Caruso left and they brought Jimmy that's Smith right. in for yeah, the second Bobby. season. So Detective it was. Detective Bobby Simone. And when he, yeah. man, it, one of the worst days of my life was when I saw the episode that Bobby Simone died on, man. It crushed me. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> good career move for Caruso leaving NYPD Blue, right? <sighs> <laughs> hey, you know, he got his thing on CSI Miami, you know. Yeah, he did, eventually. Yeah, took it off. Did, but, yep. yeah, no, we had a similar conversation with, uh, you know, our buddy Billy Smith. You know, Irish guy, Boston accent, former cop and Marine. That's what he plays. He plays, not to use the F word again, but he plays FBI agents in Homeland, and he, and he plays, sure. you know, Massachusetts State Troopers. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, that's what the role he fits in. But he makes Absolutely. a good he makes a good living doing it. Yeah, Mo, I don't want to I don't want to lose our audience here because they're not that smart because they're mostly cops and military. But <laughs> but but I believe the term would be typecast in Hollywood terms, correct? Absolutely, yes, sir. That's what it is. Well, if so, so but Mo, you were able to successfully 
I mean, and just just on You've that resume, you, got, yeah, you were able to stay in the mix though and keep it going and, and bounce around quite a bit and do, and you were able to do some very different kinds of roles, man. You know, I I, I think it's just it's just timing and luck, yep. um, because, you know. I was playing these bad guys Italian and even being Cuban and fluent in Spanish, I wasn't getting the opportunities because my last name wasn't Gonzalez or Sanchez. Right. And then I come across and I get hired to do Too Fast, which was um, a special like point of my career because I got to go home to Miami. Um, I got to play this Spanish bad guy and you know even after this much time like that is what i get recognized the most for i mean that was you so huge you don't realize what it was i remember i had just done end of days with schwarzenegger and i got sent this script called red line and was the first fast and furious and i read this and i was like okay whatever you know i didn't think anything of it then the first one came out it was a hit, but it still wasn't anything. So then I get to do the second one, Vin Diesel bows out. I get to go in there. I'm in the car with Paul Walker the whole time. Yep. And you still don't even know what it is. And then the third one comes and now, you know, they're up to number 10. Crazy. And, and I never thought it was gonna be that much, you know, but you're part of one of these big franchises that it's just like the James Bond movies. It's James Bond, Fast and the Furious. Um, it has these legs and you're known for it. And I, it's kind of a curse because I want, I've done so much work since then, but that is the movie that I get recognized the most for. And I want, um, I want, I want something to replace that, you know? Absolutely. No, Absolutely. And get one. You, I mean, you said you credit it to luck and timing, but the thing is, at that point in your career, you had a lot of credibility. You've been on some big sets and played some real, and been part of some major stuff. So to get that, you, that didn't happen by accident. Yep. You know, you, you had the credibility to get there. Thank you. Yes, you forget that. Um, another part that I'm learning now that I'm in my fifties is, is. Um, I didn't, I didn't appreciate these moments when I was younger because I was so hungry that I was looking past everything, you know? I, I, would, I would just be forging ahead, like what's next, when, what's next? And now I've learned, I have a really good friend of mine that we've met on the set of Too Fast and uh, we've been now friends for 18 years now. And a couple years ago he said, I made a point when I go on set to not bring my cell phone. And he goes, I sit there and I'm present with everything going on. And I started taking that, I started carrying that with me. And because of that, I sit there and I, I end up having these great conversations with the writers, the producers, the director. And when I was younger, I was, I was, um, I was, I was, the kind of actor who was like, I'm going to show up and then I'm going to hide and just, I'm here to do my work and I'm serious. Yeah. And now as I'm older, I get to appreciate and watch and just, and feel the, the, the gratitude because I'm lucky to do what I love to do and to have these, these surreal out of body experiences where, you know, I remember being a little kid, and watching the Rockford Files with my dad. And however many years later, you're, you're sitting there and James Garner is taking you under his wing and sharing 50 years of experience with you. I know uh, that the, that's crazy. that perspective is great. And now you know, that you got so many years in the business, think about the young guys who are, this is their first role. It's their first time on a major movie set. And they look to you, again, a face that's recognizable in the industry, and they're like, man, that's that guy. I mean, I'm sure they pick your brain uh, often, or if they're smart, they do. You know, I, 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 I kind of take it upon myself to, I remember when I was filming Chicago Fire, there was a day and one of the younger guys was having the hardest time getting, 
getting his words out. And after every take, he would mess up and he kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I pulled him aside and I said, don't ever say you're sorry. You're giving your power away. Mm -hmm. I said, you go do your thing. Just go do your thing. You don't apologize. If you mess up, you just stand there and you get ready to do it again. Because I want, you know, your body language changes when you're, you're apologizing and feeling uh, inadequate. And you know you can do it. You just have to get there and do it. Uh, I, had, I had this crazy experience that this is, um, when I was filming End of Days, I, I was there for weeks because Arnold, like, he had his bodybuilding show going on, the one that he did um, in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, that one. So he kept kind of coming in and out and like had, was paying a lot of attention. So I, we were filming in this huge church in Koreatown and not knowing when we were going to get to this part. And they had given me this huge monologue to learn in Latin. And they had a Latin coach for me. Um, I was like, yeah, I can do this. I was excited to do something like that. Um, and I, I was not knowing when we were going to shoot that. So one day we're in the church and they were shooting something and they, they were about to turn around and they go, Oh, we can do that thing right now. Let's do it right now. And they're like, you ready? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So you have to remember 1999 was, you know, 99% of the things that are shot today are on video. It's not film like it was back in the day. So 1999, we're shooting on film. So there, you know, everything costs so much money. It's, yeah. it, um, it's, it's expensive. It's time consuming. It's, it's, they have to line up everything perfectly. So I am standing on the, the pulpit of this gigantic church to do this, this monologue in Latin. Everyone is standing below it's dead quiet and they go action and i blanked and all i heard was that silence and my heart i mean i'm feeling my heartbeat i've never had an experience like that it's a big like probably my second biggest movie that i'm doing at the time and i'm freaking out and then i the 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 latin coach was there and I just said, you know, what's the first line? He gave me the first one and then I did it. But for years, I remembered that silence and I promised myself, I don't ever wanna be put in that position where they're waiting for me. So I make sure that I know my lines. I make sure I know everyone else's lines. I put that much pressure on myself when I got a job because of that, that silence that I just felt so responsible for. And I didn't want I didn't want anyone to look different at me like I I couldn't do my job. I think people underestimate the the difficulty because you're just reading lines, you're just up there. But you know, having seen uh, a couple, you know, and lose non scripted life of acting with bad guys, you know, it's it's a there's a little less pressure because you know it can flow. You can say what you want, but there's huge pressure because of the dynamic, but the amount of influence that movie scenes have in today's society is, is tremendous. I mean, I know anybody, I can talk to anybody about a certain movie and they start to quote things. They start to throw it out and they go, you know, when we start talking about courtroom scenes and that kind of Jack Nicholson and a few good men and everybody starts quoting all these lines, our society is so focused on those things that those scenes, I mean, what an impact they have on, on the world today. Totally. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about the movie True Romance, and I was like, you know, two of my favorite scenes are in that movie. You know, you have Dennis Hopper and Christopher Walken going at, uh, at it with that Chesterfield moment. Um, Not and a then, favorite scene for us Italians, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, you know, to see Gary Oldman as this Rastafari. That was awesome, man. That was you know, awesome. like that, and I'm like sitting there talking to my friend and she had never seen this movie. I was like, what, you don't oh. know? And then I start going into like, just what you said. It's you start, so you know, you start bringing it to life. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's that's the effect. You know, I, I, I know, depending on where I am, the the fans of the of the fast and furious fan franchise they come out like i know 
where I am, like how it's going to affect. I get off the plane when I, I, I go to Cabo like once a year. Mexico, it's such a huge hit in there. You go there and, um, cool. you know, they're like, oh my God, rápido, so They're like, you know, <laughs> no. Like I was playing golf with my friend at a golf course in, in Cabo and the workers were following us around and as every hole, like there were more people and then, you know, you end up taking pictures. So I've had to learn to like, it's not my nature. I'm very quiet. I'm reserved. I, I, I consider myself a guy who is like the lunch pail worker. I bring my lunch pail to work. I go do my job and I leave. I don't care about the glamour side of this. I don't need to go be seen. I don't need to be photographed. That's not why I do what I do. Um, I'm just a regular guy who just fell into doing this thing and it stuck. I tell you, it's a great story, Mo. And what, what strikes me is uh, like all this wisdom that you've gained from your experiences, you know, you know what you're telling us, what you know now, uh, it's just a shame that no matter if you're an actor, whatever you do, we don't have that wisdom when we're in our young 20s because we don't have the experience to gain that wisdom. But you don't know whether you don't but know. But if you could build a time machine, I mean, holy cow. Right? Well, no, I just think, look, I have my little one here next to me and um, I try to teach her my life lessons, you know? Like when I when I have to get into a conversation, I, I, I always explain what my logic is. I'm like, do you understand? Like, I'm not, I'm not angry at you. I'm just trying to teach you something. Yep. So you don't have to hear it anymore and I don't have to say it anymore. No, and parenting in this day and age is, is different than when we grew up. Oh for my sure. God. But the inclusion, you know, it's no longer kids aren't to be, they're only to be seen, not heard or anything like that. To, to include kids now, I think is invaluable. So welcome to your first podcast experience, by the way, young lady. And Ophelia, I already know you're gonna you're gonna be a fine young lady. I can tell already. I see it in your eyes. I'm uh, I'm very lucky with this one. I she's amazing. Like, so Miss Ophelia, I got I got a question for you. Uh -huh. uh, after seeing your dad and all all these movies and on TV and stuff, is there acting in your future? I don't know. Um, what are you talking about? You don't know. You're in a play right now. Okay, so let me talk. Oh, sorry. Whoa. take it away, Ophelia. Let's hear it. Um, so, um, I'm gonna get to the play a little after this, but uh, so, so, um, one time dad did get um, someone, Ruby, Ruby. Ruby. Um, Rudy. We were going to do it, and it just became a little too Ruby funny. was one of my agents who reps kids, and so, they met her, and they loved her. Of course. But, um, with my parents, it was just getting really complicated. It wasn't the right time. It, it wasn't the right time. Yeah. So um, that didn't work out. <laughs> but right now, I am doing a play, um, a community um, class act. That, that's what it's called. Um, awesome. We're doing The Little Mermaid. Oh, I love that. I love that. She has a solo uh, singing, something that I can't do, but she's oh, going to sing. Look Beautiful. Out. Hey, Ophelia, I have a question for you. Is it, what does it feel like to turn on the television and see your dad on the screen? Is it weird? It's not weird it's kind of cool sometimes because uh as my um as he was saying uh when we went to cabo we were staying in a hotel room <clears throat> and we were out i think we were at the pool or the beach or something and we came back and they just had this huge um it wasn't huge it was like this big a, a chocolate piano like it was like a no, yeah. there was more. There was a whole well, there tray was more. of there was more. champagne there was more. I just, and... I know, so I let, let me finish. There was like this big um, chocolate <laughs> piano, and it was like this big. And then they were, had this like really long plate, like this big. And it had like sugar all over the bottom. There was a bunch of fruit. There were fish eggs. It didn't like, I don't like fish eggs. So I was like, eh. Okay. But there were like two big glasses, and they were full of sugar. And there was like chocolates. And I, I remember I like took a chocolate and I was like dipping it in the sugar. 
and there were like fruits all around the bottom. It was pretty cool. So um, those are the perks of hanging out with a cool old guy, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, they sent that and they said welcome, and it was yeah, it was a nice, cool. nice That's gesture. Hard. That's what yeah. I covered you. Okay, uh, I hope you think that your dad is cool, because what he does is super cool. Now my kids, for they don't think I'm cool, right? Like none of it. They, they, they don't think I'm cool. No. But I hope you think your dad is cool, because being in movies and being on t- cool TV shows is very cool. Yeah, my son not impressed with me at all. No, he's not. And cool. lose kids. They're not impressed with me at all either. Have to check that podcast yet? <laughs> but they, my my son is a podcast kid, right? He's fifteen. Uh-huh. He doesn't watch mine. Doesn't watch ours. Yeah, he doesn't watch ours. Yeah. And also, like when we we go to Universal a lot, uh, we have a year pass. I think. Did it just awesome. Say? No, no, it's still good. Uh, it's still good. Uh, we we <laughs> go there a lot, like a lot of the time. Um, so whenever we go there on the studio tour, they have this uh, whole Fast and the Furious thing. Oh, perfect. If it's like a virtual reality kind of, um, you have like uh, I should say three D. It's three D. You have like these glasses that you put on, and you get to go through. And is Universal paying you to like promote this? Or what? It's kind of <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Any, anyway, so. I see the Universal banner coming across. Right. Right. <laughs> we'll have the producer put it on. Yeah. So, good, good plug. Yeah. Um. So it's just cool to see, um, like one of the movies, like it's a pretty famous movie to be in, like the yeah. what is it called, studio tour. Yeah, in, yeah, that um, you're you're part of that. You're part of history. When he was like in there, um, it's it's about um, this dude. He's actually bald, like my dad. The Rock. No, no. <laughs> I've heard of him. Different uh, dude. Uh-huh. Different dude. And there's like this uh, car, and he's been, he's like a criminal, and and his car was like parked in front of this old like rundown place, and and inside you would go in, and the driver would like pretend that there's like this is actually a criminal about like it's just a story so, take yeah, off of the yeah the, to the, make the, it seem like fun yeah so you go in and they have these big like um white kind of screens here and they would project these 3d things um of the people in the fast and furious um i forgot the girl's name but uh the rock vin diesel and the criminals I've never heard of them yeah so they would just you'd go in and then and then the bad guy would come and you'd have to like do a big like car chase yeah, it's cool. Um, and they have the cars for the movie like out it's there, cool. so they have a couple paths there. And then they show you like all the all the cars for the movie. She just watched uh over the holidays, a Christmas holiday. I showed her Chicago Fire. She hadn't yeah. seen it, so she watched the from the beginning when I was on it. So that was fun because she was two years old and she uh do you even remember coming? Like I went she to Chicago. Would, yeah, no, but you were I, two years old and you got I to like remember. get on the fire trucks oh, and I did all the that. Running. I remember going on the fire trucks, even though my tiny walnut brain being a two year old, I still remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ophelia is going to be a star. Yeah, man. I'm I, telling you right now, I, can, I see it. I see the star Ophelia, power, right? There. You're awesome. Man. I'll tell you, young hey. lady, the, the other thing you need to do, and what you're really, really, you're lucky and you're blessed, is years from now when you have. Uh, your own kids, you can show them your dad's body of work, and I can imagine that's going to be a oh, lot cool of fun that? for you. Cool you know, one of the the favorite Mark my things. words, you'll be proud. One thing that I did, I did this Disney movie. I don't know if you guys have seen those videos. They did the. It was called Air Bud with the Golden Retrievers. Yep. They've okay. continued these series with the little puppies, and I did one of those movies called Treasure Buddies, and I was up in Canada. They're so cute. And you know that was the first thing that that I could show her that I did, even though I'm you know I'm playing this bumbling that, that, Arab bad that's guy. That's really cool because I love that you did that because whenever in Universal Studios they have this like show the dog actors. Universal. Actor, Universal. <laughs> um, the the animal actors show. So they bring out a bunch of animals that were in like movies with really famous actors, but. One of the things I love the most in the, not the last time we went there, but the time before, um, 
is that I used to watch this one Chihuahua movie like over and over and over when I was a kid, like at least 10 times each movie. That's um, my daughter right there. Too. Yeah. Um, and we went to the show and they brought out the two Chihuahuas that were in that movie. So that like made me super happy because I got to pet them and stuff. That's awesome. I used to watch the time. I'm going to Universal. Uh, Universal. Uh, Last time that we went, not the second last time, uh, they brought out one of the golden retrievers that played um, in Treasure Buddies, one of the puppies. Yeah. So oh, I mean, he was in there. So. Yes. Like, really, you're awesome. You really are. Doesn't get much she, cooler she's than She's taking that. over the podcast, which I love. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mo. Yes, sir. I hate to. Uh, first of all, this was awesome. This was a, a much lighter atmosphere, uh, which we needed. Absolutely. You know, which uh, you know, the last one, the last podcast we did was, was heavy, real heavy. Yeah. We needed something to lighten it up, and this was awesome. And, and hearing about your experiences, how you got into it, and how, how you've made a career out of this is, is awesome. And I hate to end a podcast by asking any of our guests, who are all incredible, a personal favor. But if you're ever on set and, and there's a, a spot like an extra for like a pudgy Irish guy, please keep Bootsy in mind. Yeah, he's always available, brother. Hey, and I don't like to brag, but again, uh, oh, having having been on set, I, I don't like to show my moves too often, but I am on film behind Academy Award winning Maris of Anna doing this. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. That's all you can ask for. Like, I mean, I can do it again if you want to see it. But, I, you know, again, I don't like to show it off too often. Well, no, you got to keep that. You don't want to throw your shoulder out, your elbows. <laughs> hey, right. Face, you never so know when I'm going to get the chance to do it again. Yep. Purple tunnels will start kicking in. You just got to chill. Like, you know, save it. Save it for your close-up. Absolutely. Right. You might have it in in Hollywood at this point. Hey, <laughs> Mo, brother, I just I want to say uh, congratulations on all the success you've had in – and we look forward to seeing what's in the future, brother, because I know you're still you're still running hot and heavy with it, man. And uh, I appreciate it, Lou. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, you know. It's good to see you. I, I um, you come from a a point of my life that was, you know, before all this. Yep. You know, it was just the beginning of that where I still, you know, was just dipping my my feet in the water. I remember. And. and uh, you know, and to hear your story, how you've gone on, and you know, we both had these these careers now, and and it seems like just yesterday. I remember you. Uh, we went to that Italian restaurant. You remember that? You took us because you knew the owner you used yeah, to go. Yeah, to yeah. And oh, you know, I remember sitting and having you know that I don't even know if it was lunch or dinner with you, but I can't you know, remember. It seems name. like yesterday. Yep. It seems like yesterday. It was this. Most you know, here we are. He's seen me really drunk. I used to drink a lot back then. Really? Yeah. I still he, held, he held it well. He just he just leaned on the wall. <laughs> he still does. He's got he's and that's exactly that's, how he does it. He has a little dent on one shoulder from most the, of us would fall, but he's like, hey, yeah. This, you know, this is the most natural thing in the world. Right. Drink is yeah. bad, Ophelia. You don't enjoy it. But Mo, seriously, brother, thank you so much for coming on. Such a cool story, such a cool career, brother. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out, and thanks for letting Ophelia hang out with us too. Young lady, it was our honor to have you. Ophelia, you are totally awesome, honey. And remember, universe. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. It was Thank awesome. Thank you, brother. Sign All right. Up. Take All right. care. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. End of Watch with Bootsy and Sal. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more.